Um, one is a paper from the American Journal of Bioethics on generative AI and just asking, so one is more ethical and this the question is, how is generative AI different from other forms of AI people have been writing about for the last five, 10 years in the bioethics literature? And this is just my attempt to kind of explain to myself what I think. One is I think there's a lot of familiar issues, but they're slightly different in ways that are interesting. The first one is just about data ownership. Uh, that I think actually some of the intellectual property questions are much more interesting in the generative AI context. We've already seen in copyright the creation, for example, of clean data sets. So Getty Image, for example, is trying to create an alternative to Midjourney and the like that uses basically certified, good provenance kind of data. What would that look like in the medical context? And is this creating going to create a market for this kind of data that's been kind of certified in this sort of way? Also, I think th I've always been puzzled by the fact that patients are so assertive about their interests, or there's so much of a discourse in bioethics about patients' rights as intellectual property coming from their specimens and their data, and so little of a discourse about physicians' interests and their contribution to the data sets and their development. So there's a way in which I'm curious about whether this is going to change things. A second thing, and this connects to what Dr. Meyer said about informed consent, that I think the ability to integrate LLMs in particular and chatbots modalities more specifically, so directly into patient-facing materials, really ups the stakes about whether we ought to have a right to know we are dealing with an artificial intelligence. So a version of a right to inform consent that an AI is involved, but one that's very direct. And humanistically, what are our obligations to tell people? I think the question of medical disinformation has just upped its game dramatically, and the possibility of creating medical deep fakes is something we're not really ready for. So as I often say, if I want to tomorrow create an absolutely false but very plausible looking New England Journal of Medicine article showing that Moderna's Booster causes sterility. I can do that in 10 minutes, full of fake citations that look real until you click through them. And the ability just to flood the zone with all of that all at once is really terrifying, especially in a period of a lot of misinformation, let alone when AI crosses the blood-brain barrier, if you will, and we connect it to email systems and the like and phone calls and the ability to kind of create fake faxes to get uh, records transferred and the like. So I think this is really scary but interesting. A different thing is just to say that I think bioethicists have not been particularly interested in antitrust, and this is the time to start to get interested into it, and in particular oligopoly. And the question about whether we're going to end up with three or four foundational models, and all of their sins be passed on to all their sons and daughter models as we go forward. There was a way in which the prior market of medical AI was interesting because it was very heterogeneous. Navigating that system as a user or as a purchaser was tricky. There was so little information about it, but at least you had many different flavors and many different curated data sets that were all a little bit different. Here are the possibility of having foundational control over a few oligopoly, I can't say the word, oligopolies, oligopolistic models. I think is quite different, both in terms of the controls of these entities on pricing and licensure and information and transparency, but also the question of variety and creativity. Uh, two more. One is just to say environmental. I don't think we're talking enough about the environmental costs of these models, especially if they go into widespread use, and the failure of the healthcare system to internalize the environmental externalities of what's created. And then lastly, just one piece of good news before I switch to the second paper, which is to say I think there is a real possibility of the democratization of expertise, which is a phrase that I borrow from Nicholson, and this idea of access and empowerment to patients. In a world where you get 15 minutes with your healthcare provider, if you're lucky, the ability to have prepped that with a virtual healthcare provider and then to understand and digest it with a virtual healthcare provider on the back end is something that I'm actually legitimately excited about. And even if imperfect, I think it might actually improve those 15 minutes. Okay, now for something completely different, which is to say, Enterprise liability. So this is a paper I worked with, I'm working on with Nicholson. You can read the uh, long version in the DePaul Annual Tort Law Symposium. I think the current draft is up on SSRN if you're curious. Um, and basically the question we want to ask ourselves, so we did prior work with Sarah and Nicholson on physician liability for medical AI errors. How should we think about in particular hospital liability and its relationship to developer liability? So at the very beginning, we kind of think that developer liability faces a lot of problems. One is the courts have consistently been reluctant to treat software as a product, often judging it as a service, and that creates a difficulty in having products liability theories. The other is just a, a more, uh, I would say, maybe normative kind of judgment, which is to say developers have an information problem that leads us to think that in many instances, uh, they're not going to be able to detect and to deter and to design the way we want. 
Put simply, they can develop products, but the implementation is the key. And implementing into a hospital system, they just don't have that much visibility into the hospital system if they're a separate entity. And so we think that there is this kind of responsibility gap between developer and hospital that's interesting. You might think the solution is to then shift the liability onto the hospital systems. And we talk in this paper about existing legal theories of derivative liability, things like negligent credentialing, things like respondeat superior, uh, things like apparent authority and the like. Our own view is that actually none of these doctrines are actually well suited for what we want to get. And we also think the courts are going to be fairly reluctant to expose hospitals to liability for AI selection on these bases. And then we think more normatively, um, you know, that we think that, I would say more normatively, uh, even if a court was open to applying one or more of these theories, right, from a sister desire, designer view, it kind of gets the problem wrong. The supervision of individual instances of care matches poorly with the opaque and systemic issues that arise from AI errors and the place-dependent uh, variation in performance that we're seeing. And therefore, we just don't think that we're going to catch what we want to or give the right incentives. The hospital may know general facts, the type of data on which the AI is trained, approximately how it was trained and validated and the like, but typically won't have the granular kind of information that lets it make good and wise predictions about how to implement well. And the hospital might lack capacity to analyze these questions because of expertise, but also because of trade secrecy and other doctrines that kind of block the sharing of the information. So we've got this problem where we think neither of the two candidates are very good candidates for liability. And so we do our law professor, you know, Jedi mind tricks, and we say, okay, well, here is a very complicated and seemingly elegant solution that probably nobody will ever adopt, but here it goes. So what we say is, uh, we think the right result is to actually have kind of a burden shifting approach, where we start with the developer, and the developer has the liability and holds the bag up until they've disclosed the kind of information necessary to make the hospital system a good implementer. And at that point, we think the burden will shift to the hospital system and they should be the one who are holding the bags of liability. Now, this raises lots of interesting and complicated questions related to enterprise liability. And Nicholson's here too, so he can give his thoughts during the Q&A as well. One of, I think, the most interesting problems with uh, enterprise liability is could you have it just for AI rather than all medical errors? How do you distinguish questions of causation and questions of tying medical errors to AI? What do you think about medical errors that occur? And, you know, just in general, whether we're off achieving exactly what we want through a contracting mechanism of indemnification, the like between these parties. And something that I think is interesting is we've seen a couple of instances, IDXDR being the most public about it, where developers are indemnifying hospital systems, but we don't have a lot of clarity about how often that's happening. And so I teach at Harvard, I don't teach at the University of Chicago, but I'll ask the University of Chicago question, which is to say, if your solution is so good, why hasn't they arrived at it by private ordering already? And I think that's an interesting question about whether there are structures here that are preventing it or the nascent nature of the market, or in fact, we just don't have a lot of visibility about them doing. I think I'm one minute under, so I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much.